Hi, it's Grandma here reading from Herodotus and the Road to History. Uh, last chapter, we talked about his travels to um, Phoenicia and Babylon, and today it's Egypt. And the ch it's chapter six, I go to Egypt. After some traveling and some time at home in about my 35th year, I sailed to Egypt. I wanted to observe with my own eyes this ancient civilization about which I had heard so much. There was no way we could keep land in sight, so we sailed by the stars. And there's a picture here of him and one of the mariners um, sailing by the stars. I stood at the raised helm with the helmsman while the others slept, and he pointed out for me the fixed scars excuse me, stars, and the ones that moved, the wanderers. About a, day, about a day's sail away from land, we began to see more and more silt in the water, certainly being washed out from the land. Then we sailed into the Nile Delta, where the great river flows into the Mediterranean Sea. This is called Lower Egypt because the Nile flows from the higher lands in the south down to the lower lands at the mouth of the river. Now, it's a little confusing because when you look at a map, you think that lower Egypt will be down here, but it isn't. Lower Egypt is up here. That's because it's going downhill. Uh, the book has a picture of with arrows and the arrows show the direction the river flows. This happens in other places also. Not everywhere does the do the rivers flow south like they do in the United States. Um, when I lived in Germany, for instance, the Alps are where the rivers began and the river flowed north to the North Sea. So I had, uh, uh, I had a hard time getting my bearings sometimes. Um, when I lived in Germany. Okay, I was astonished at the soil there, rich, black as pitch, and I think it must be the most fertile in the world. Farms are everywhere with wheat as the main crop. The farmers don't have to think about rain or irrigation. They just wait for their fields to be watered by the Nile as the river floods out of its banks every year. When the Nile floods, this whole part of Egypt becomes a great sea. Our boat didn't have to stay in the banks, <laughs> didn't have to stay in the banks of the river at all. Why does the Nile flood only in the summer? I don't know. Where does the Nile come from? I don't know that either. Heke, he, excuse me, Hecatias says it flows from the great ocean, but I don't believe that. And by the great ocean, I think he's talking about the Atlantic or possibly the Indian Ocean. I am still trying to think of a scientific explanation for these problems. Uh, well, like in Europe, what it is is that the Nile flows out of mountains. When the snow melts, the water all goes down downhill and it forms into rivers. But he didn't know that. They hadn't explored Africa. Matter of fact, that wasn't discovered until I think the 1800s or 1900s where the Nile began. The Nile Delta is crowded with cities. There must be 20,000 towns in Egypt. There are colonies from all over Greece, even from Helicarnassus as they trade through the Mediterranean as far as the Pillars of Hercules. And that's Gibraltar, that's that uh, little piece of, of ocean that connects, um, it's called a strait, S-T-R-A-I-T, and it connects the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean. There are also many Greek tourists who have come to marvel at what the Egyptians have built long before our own history. I'm sure Hecatius didn't come as a tourist. He was interested in deeper things. The Egyptian people in their manners and customs seem to have reversed the ordinary practices of mankind. The women go to the market and take care of business. 
while many men are either priests or stay home weaving. What would you say about our culture? Who goes to the market most often, the men or the women? Who takes care of the business, the men or the women? And who does the weaving or sewing? And who, it, who are the priests? Ours is kind of a combination, isn't it? Our culture is more of a combination of the um, Greeks and the Egyptians. So we're a little bit different from them also. Anyway, and they have doctors for every part of the body. In Greece, a doctor treats the whole body. But the Egyptians have doctors for eyes, heads, hearts, stomach, even teeth. Now, which one are we more like? Are we more like the Greek, where they treat the whole body? Or are we more like the Egyptians, where we treat parts of the body? Depends upon what kind of a doctor you go to. Most doctors in the United States are um, specialized. Um, but there are doctors who treat the whole body. They do seem very healthy, but they have an unhealthy obsession with death. He's talking about the Egyptians. Egyptian science must be the best anywhere. The Egyptians discovered the solar year, and they were the first to divide the year into 12 parts, 30 days each. And as I traveled around, I was impressed by the way they used geometry for so many practical purposes. Everywhere I saw surveyors using instruments to measure the land. Their engineers had been using geometry for thousands of years to construct their enormous buildings. And we have a picture showing them. And uh, yes, geometry is what's used to uh, build the pyramids. Anyone would be amazed, gaping at the pyramids, which were built 2,000 years ago, which means it's more like three or 4,000 years ago for us. But I think it must have exhausted the Egyptian people to build them. I cannot even calculate how many people, how much time and treasure that took. The Egyptian kings certainly weren't afraid to take on grand projects. Many years ago, King Nekos began to excavate a canal that would connect the Nile River to the Red Sea. Nekos never finished the canal, but years later, Darius was why, uh, did, and I saw the remains of that canal. The canal was wide enough so that two triremes could row there side by side. Sailing from the Nile to the Red Sea took only four days. I heard a fast way to get to the Red Sea and on to India. The canal has fallen into disuse, but the idea of a shortcut was a good one. Someone will surely try it again. Maybe there's a better place to build it. So we have a picture here and it shows you with the dotted line, the canal that he was talking about. We do have a canal that is uh, connects these two and it's called the Suez Canal and let me get you a, a bigger picture. Okay. Okay. And it goes now from here, down to here, to here. And that's how the Suez Canal goes. The old canal that they were talking about started out about here on the river and went over to this lake and down. I don't know which way is shorter or better, but the Suez Canal works. In our sailing boat, which is different from any I have seen, we sailed up the Nile. Now remember that for them to sail up the Nile, they are starting here and they are going this way to go up. Okay, so they're starting out here and they are going up the Nile. 
Okay, you might, if you have a book, you might want to keep your finger in the book because we're going to talk about that trip. <clears throat> it is a nine days journey from Heliopolis, and um, Heliopolis is right here on the map. Okay, so it's going to take them nine days to go up the river. Why would it take them that long? Well, because they're going up the river. They are fighting the current. And um, if they were going down the river, probably it would only take a couple of days, but it takes longer to go up the river. Uh, to Thebes, which for ages has been the capital of Egypt. So they are going from Heliopolis down here to Thebes. Okay. The building, <clears throat> buildings and statues there are astonishing. I think Thebes must be the oldest city in the world. To prove how old their civilization is, the priests showed me statues of more than 300 generations of their ancestors. They were all human beings. The Egyptians are amused that the Greeks believe, as I do, that we are descended from gods. They do believe that once long ago, the gods had lived and ruled among humans, but they were quite separate and did not have human children. I respect the Egyptian gods, most of whom are represented by animals. And here we have a picture down here of those gods that are represented by animals. We have Hathar, the goddess of love and beauty, has a cow head. And Thoth, the god of wisdom, has the head of an ibis, which is a bird. Anubis is the god of the underworld and it is a jackal, which is more of a dog-like. Isis and Osiris, the most important gods, and now we're looking at these pictures over here, look more human, even though their son Horus, who's the baby on the lap, has the head of a falcon, which is a bird. Horus was the last of the gods. Egyptians hoped to end their human lives as mummies who lived on in the underworld. The priests were generous in allowing me to observe how mummies are made. Even some animals are mummified to live in that later world. The process is complicated. It takes days, even weeks. We continued up the Nile to the Elephantine. Okay, so he was here in Thebes. And now he's going to the Elephantine right down here. For the whole journey, the sailing had been fairly easy, even against the current. The winds at that time of the year blow steadily from north to south. So we sailed with the wind. And I don't know if you saw that, the picture of the sailboat that they used. But the cataracts of the Nile begin at the Elephantine. Now cataracts, you may remember that grandpa had cataracts removed from his eyes, but this is a whole different kind of cataract. This is uh, shallow water that is uh, possibly rocky and has, um, it's white water. So white water means that it has rocks and it's going downhill and it becomes, uh, the water becomes white because it's blowing very, or, excuse me, flowing very quickly. We have a, a place in St. Louis uh, that's called Chain of Rocks, and it's where there's a chain of rocks that goes all the way across the Mississippi River, and there's white water all along there. Uh, back in the old days, they had to take the boats out of the water and, and go around the chain of rocks. Now we have canals that uh, go around the, the chain of rocks. I stopped there. Elephantine is the limit of the Persian Empire, and I decided not to go on to explore Ethiopia. So the Elephantine is an island, and it's also the edge of the Persian Empire. I would have liked to have explored Ethiopia. 
I have heard that the Ethiopians are the tallest, best looking people in the world and that they live to be 120 years old. Cambyses, the Persian king after Cyrus, had tried and failed to conquer Ethiopia. But Ethiopian soldiers had come back to Persia and later served in Xerxes' army. Witnesses told me that they were the handsomest people in the world, that they carried gold-tipped spears and wore leopard or lion skins into battle. And there's a picture of them there, all ready for battle with their spears. Now we traveled back to the Nile Delta because I wanted to visit Pelusium. Okay, so now he has traveled back up and Pelusium is right here on the edge of the Delta. There's another map right here where we saw the canals that shows you where Pelusium is. Okay. And that was the battlefield where the Persian Cambyses had defeated Egypt in one great battle. Then I sailed, sailed west to the Greek colony of Cyrene on the bulge of Africa. That was as far west as I went. There was still more that I wanted to see, so I went east again. And here we've got this map that we're looking at. Here is as far west as he went in Cyrene. And then we have Egypt. And now he's going home. And he's going along the coast. <clears throat> All the way along the Phoenician coast to Tyre, where some 500 years ago, Hiram, the king, had supplied the cedar to help Solomon build the temple in Jerusalem. Finally, I was ready to go home. I sailed north past Cyprus and Rhodes and back to Halicarnassus. In my wanderings, I had heard hundreds of stories. I had gathered personal memories of the Persian Wars. I had explored seas and rivers, new kinds of plants and strange animals. I meant to stop and talk to you about the strange animals. What strange animals did he see in Egypt that he had never seen before? Can you tell what they are? Crocodile and a hippopotamus. Okay. I had traveled so much that I would describe the geography of much of the known world. Now I wanted to collect my ideas and adventures and write it all down. Am I a scientist, a geographer, or a historian? Maybe I am all of these. What would you call him? I would, I would think I would call him more of a geographer. He is um, mapping everything out and learning the culture and ways of the people. But he's also exploring history. Um, anyway, I think Herodotus has done a wonderful thing for... Um, the world at that time by writing these stories down, which by the way, is the topic of chapter seven. I write my histories. So that's what chapter seven is going to be about is him writing everything that he is learning about on his travels. Okay, bye-bye.